Of all the exciting tales of adventure in the universal heritage of fact and folklore, very few have had the wide appeal of the thrilling stories of the great American West. The exploration and conquest of this vast area was a peak of accomplishment in man's eternal quest for new frontiers. And it has inspired more popular melodrama than any other of his obsessions. Wealth, war, political intrigue, and the pursuit of women. The appeal of the Western in movies and television probably lies in the fact that it is a classic tale, proving that our side is more deserving than their side, and that the good people win in the end. Periodically, there is a complaint about violence in historical dramas, and in a way, the outcry may be justified. If TV and the movies have convinced you that each day of the week was riddled with murder and mayhem, then they have gone too far. But simply to deny violence as such is to deny history. The first explorers brought a civilization of violence to lands whose very terrain, weather, and inhabitants were violent. The natives were savage at the start and were made even more so by the treatment they received. It is fortunate, perhaps, that very little of this historical truth has ever made its way to the picture tube or the movie screen. If you don't count the Norse legends and the brief visits of John Cabot for the English, the Spanish were the first ever to do anything about the North American continent. They had a vested interest in the efforts of Columbus, of course, but after all, Columbus never touched the North American shores. On his first voyage in 1492, he landed in the Bahamas, went southwest until he hit the northern coast of Cuba, and then turned back to the north shore of Haiti. He thought Cuba was Japan, and that India and China lay just beyond. So he called his new world the West Indies. The first Spanish explorer on the mainland was Juan Ponce de Leon, who claimed Florida in 1513 while searching for an island called Bimini, where there was supposed to be a fountain providing eternal youth. His interest undoubtedly was based on the fact that he was in his early 50s. In the 16th century, that amounted to living on borrowed time. But Ponce de Leon found nothing but hostile Indians, so he left. This was the standard Spanish approach. If there was no immediate profit in sight, they looked elsewhere. Perhaps this is why they were the world's greatest explorers, but never won any coveted awards as colonists. If there was gold or any other treasure that could be loaded aboard ship while they watched, or if the natives could be persuaded or forced to produce anything else of value without bringing sweat to a conquistador's brow, the Spanish were pleased. But they did not settle down and do any work themselves, except for the earnest conversion of heathen souls. And when the wealth was gone, they boarded ship and went somewhere else. By 1517, the easily available gold in Cuba was just about exhausted, and an expedition set out for the mainland. They landed on the Yucatan Peninsula and got into a fight with the natives. <laughs> 
The fight didn't go right, so they departed. But they took with them some samples of native handiwork in terracotta and gold alloyed with copper. This evidence of possible treasure was inspiring. The next step, of course, was invasion by Hernando Cortez. This conquest, as thorough as it turned out to be, was no brutal massacre of simple natives. In city after city, Cortez faced tough, trained soldiers led by skilled commanders. He was outnumbered, but everything else was on his side. His cannon terrified the enemy, and his horse troops convinced them that they were up against some kind of weird half-man, half-animal. From that point, exploration was given a push forward. For to satisfy his greedy captains, Cortez had to send them out in search for more treasure. But real interest in the lands to the north did not begin until after the amazing adventures of Alwar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, who spent eight years walking nearly two-thirds of the way across the North American continent. Cabeza de Vaca was treasurer to an expedition of 400 colonists, which set out in 1528 to establish control in Florida. After a disastrous search for a rumored gold area in a country full of unfriendly Indians, the survivors tried to build boats and get away, but that was as unsuccessful as the search for treasure. After eight years, Cabeza de Vaca and three survivors arrived in westernmost Mexico, where they encountered Spanish cavalry scouts. Except for the fact that he was still alive after the ordeal, Cabeza de Vaca had little of importance to relate. He saw no rich cities and very few people who even looked well-fed. And he had absolutely no information that would lead anybody to believe the country he had been through was worth ever visiting again. Nonetheless, the Spanish, three years later, launched three separate explorations in search of wealth. They had no reason to doubt the discouraging reports of Cabeza de Vaca, but their own legends that seven rich cities existed out there somewhere west of Spain had been bolstered by discovering the Aztecs had an almost identical story. Hernando de Soto, with 600 men, 200 horses and other equipment, went from Cuba to Florida and then launched a winding, almost aimless journey across what are now the southern states. In four years, he covered an area of 350,000 miles, wandering as far north as the junction of the Canadian and Arkansas rivers, south nearly to Mobile Bay, and as far west as the headwaters of the Brazos River. The 311 survivors finally floated down the Mississippi in barges and returned to Mexico without any treasure. In February of 1540, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was sent to investigate Cibola, rumored to be one of the fabled cities. Cibola, of course, was nothing but an adobe village it was disappointingly without treasure, so there was nothing to do but push on. And from the Grand Canyon of the Colorado on the west to the Pecos River on the east, Coronado found neither gold nor silver. Then from a Plains Indian they called the Turk, they heard about Quivira, a place of fabulous wealth. They searched for a year, and then strangled the Turk to death because he admitted he had made up the story to get the Spanish to leave the Pecos country. But in the meantime, Coronado's expedition covered a lot of territory. Like De Soto, he found nothing that could be sacked up and taken home, so he left. And there ended the major Spanish explorations. Others followed, of course, and settlements were established in Florida, 
California and in the Southwest. But there was never again a large-scale probing operation. Even in the Southwest, they stuck more or less to the edge of the Great Plains because dealing with the Apaches and Comanches was nothing but endless trouble. The Anglo-American explorers in the West conquered no great cities of Aztecs or comparable culture because there weren't any. They made no attempts to convert the Indians to religion and probably didn't bother to ask if the Indians were hiding any treasure. Except for the mountain men who were after furs, most of those who penetrated the wilderness did so because they were looking for a reasonable way to get from one place to another. The first official exploring party was the famed Lewis and Clark expedition of 1803, suggested by President Thomas Jefferson and approved by Congress. Meriwether Lewis, who had been Jefferson's private secretary, and William Clark, Lewis's friend, were directed to trace the Missouri River to its source, cross the Rocky Mountains, and in the words of the instructions, follow the best water communication which offers itself thence to the Pacific Ocean. This turned out to be the Columbia River. The mission was accomplished, and although many historians have complained that neither Lewis nor Clark had the education or ability to compile the kind of records one would expect from such an expedition, the journey itself stands out as something of an achievement. The exploration and return trip lasted three years, and before Lewis and Clark were back to report success, Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike was assigned to cross the Middle Plains to the Rocky Mountains, making note of animal and plant life the general terrain and its possible uses, Indians and their activities, and likely routes for travel. He was successful in his venture, exploring as far south as the present city of Pueblo, Colorado, and was the first to sight the towering peak that bears his name. Another official expedition of considerable importance was the journey of Major Stephen H. Long to the Rocky Mountains in 1820. He was instructed to follow the Platte River west toward the Rockies and return to the Mississippi by way of the Arkansas and Red Rivers. Major Long's party was the first to be adequately equipped for the gathering of scientific information, establishing a procedure followed in subsequent explorations. And as it always happens in first demonstrations of a good thing, something went wrong. Two fellows deserted and took off some of the most valuable records. Besides that, Major Long mistook the Canadian River for the Red and didn't learn his mistake until he reached the Arkansas. But all things considered, it was a successful expedition. Today, in the Colorado Rockies, a lofty pinnacle bears the name of Long's Peak. The names of other explorers read like a roll call to answer up for history, officially and unofficially, and sometimes for their own reasons. They made maps, hunted sites for settlements, sought wagon trails to the gold of California or the rich farmlands of the Northwest and finally, likely routes for the Transcontinental Railroad. A notable flamboyant character always in some kind of trouble was John Charles Fremont, whose activities earned him the title of the Pathfinder. He mapped the Oregon Trail in 1842 and later became so involved in the affairs preceding the Mexican War of 1848 that he was court-martialed for disobeying orders.
but he was elected one of the first two U.S. Senators from California and was the Republican nominee for president in 1856. His personality and belligerent nature caused him to be relieved of an important military command during the Civil War, and after that, he lost his fortune in railroad ventures. Without regard for their place in history, you can also list Colonel Philip St. George Cook, who chartered the first wagon road to California, Josiah Gregg, who was fascinated with the sea-like quality of the plains, and was the first to call the big wagons prairie schooners, Bill Sublet, the mountain man who turned South Pass into a beaten path. John Coulter, who discovered the fantastic marvels of Yellowstone. And the great John Wesley Powell, noted geologist and pioneer explorer of the Green and Colorado Rivers. Those are a few of the names. There were hundreds of other adventuresome spirits who found a shorter way from here to there, who named a bluff or a creek or found a shallow crossing of a troublesome stream, but whose names have been obscured in the dust churned up by the migrating hardy pioneers. there was one explorer and map maker whose accomplishments far exceeded the recognition he has been accorded. He was acclaimed in his day, but he has been overshadowed as the years passed by other heroes who added considerably less to the store of geographical knowledge. He was Randolph B. Marcy, a professional soldier nearly all his life. He served in the Mexican War under General Zachary Taylor and later achieved the rank of Major General during the Civil War. But his career as explorer and adventurer in the West began shortly after the conflict with Mexico. In November of 1848, Marcy was made commander of Fort Towson in the Choctaw Nation. While there, he became an authority on the largely uncharted Red River region. From 1849 to 1858, Marcy conducted five major expeditions throughout the Southwest and Rocky Mountain areas. His detailed maps, especially of New Mexico, Texas, and present-day Oklahoma, were for the most part the first accurate charts of almost unexplored regions. He was the first Anglo-American to discover and map the principal sources of the Red River, the first to explore the headwaters of the Colorado, Brazos, and Wichita rivers. He designated sites for a series of frontier forts, many of which, like Fort Sill, Oklahoma, still exist on the spot Marcy selected. He named streams and mountains, blazed new trails, and collected so much information on the Southern Plains Indians that he is still recognized as the leading authority on Indians prior to the Civil War. Marcy's career as an explorer began in March of 1849 when he was ordered to Fort Smith, Arkansas to command a military detachment escorting some 2,000 immigrants bound for the California gold rush as far as Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was also instructed to determine the best route from Fort Smith to Santa Fe, survey, measure, and map it, and while en route to hold diplomatic conferences with the principal chiefs of the Plains Indians. Marcy's expedition provided the first accurate maps of this route to the west with notations about campsites, the location of wood and water, and other information useful to immigrants but possibly his greatest contribution was in shortening the route to California by some 300 miles. It was customary for travelers bound for California from Santa Fe to go down the Rio Grande 
300 miles to Donna Anna, 60 miles above El Paso, before intercepting Cook's wagon road to California. Marcy reasoned it would be better to mark a trail from Fort Smith directly to Donna Anna. He was right, and the route he selected quickly became a link in a great highway from east to west. When John Butterfield established his famous Overland Express Line from St. Louis to San Francisco, more than one third of its course overlapped Marcy's route. But Captain Marcy's most spectacular achievement came during the famous but slightly misnamed war against the Mormons in Utah. The trouble began after the end of the Mexican War when the Mormons, who had fled the authority of the United States and established their own colony in what is now Utah, discovered that under the terms of the Mexican cession, they were part of the United States again. Trying to preserve their institutions and the authority of their leaders, the Mormons sought immediate statehood, saw that wouldn't work, and then asked, territorial status. This was granted by Congress in 1850, and Brigham Young was made governor. But under the terms of the charter, three non-Mormons had to serve in administrative posts, and that didn't work out too well. They were ignored, and two of them resigned and went back east to report that the Mormons were plotting to establish an independent nation. This caused a great outcry throughout the country, and in 1857, the president named non-Mormons to serve as governor and in other administrative posts. Congress ordered strict enforcement of all federal laws and authorized a military escort to take the new officials to Salt Lake City. The Mormons were outraged, interpreted this action as a declaration of war, and gave notice that they would resist. So then the War Department ordered 2,500 infantry and cavalry to Salt Lake City to see to it that the laws were obeyed. Captain Marcy's company was one of the units. The troops started out from Fort Leavenworth in July, and it took them until November to get through South Pass and assemble near Fort Bridger, 500 miles west of Fort Laramie, and 112 miles east of the Mormon capital. And this is where the expedition stopped. More than half of the 7,000 animals had starved or frozen to death crossing the mountains from Laramie to Bridger. So it was decided to wait until spring before moving on. Colonel Albert Sidney Johnston, commander of the famous 2nd Cavalry, arrived to take command and immediately began to consider the feasibility of sending a force southwest across the mountains to New Mexico for supplies and more animals. Jim Bridger, the old mountain man, warned against it, but on November 24th, Captain Marcy was ordered to select some volunteers and go. He had 40 soldiers, 25 mountain men, and 65 mules. They had rations for 30 days, and their destination was Fort Massachusetts, about 90 miles north of Taos, a journey of 634 miles. Marcy figured that with any luck at all, the trip would take 25 days. They had luck all right, but it was all bad. They staggered and crawled through the snow and ice for 52 days. Their clothes were in tatters, and for shoes, they wore strips of green hide cut from the mules that dropped dead in the arduous struggle over the mountains. Marcy himself lost 40 pounds, and hardly anybody else was in better shape physically. When they were in sight of their goal, supply wagons from Fort Massachusetts brought out soup, coffee, butter, bread, salt, and tobacco, plus a jug of brandy, which was passed around. Some of the half-starved travelers became crazily drunk on one drink. Marcy ordered a strict ration of one cup of soup, coffee, and bread, cautioning the men against the dangers of overeating after being so long without food but several ignored the warning. One of them died, and he was the only casualty of the entire journey. After a rest, 
Marcy returned to Fort Bridger with supplies and animals for the Mormon campaign, but the war never came off. On April 6, 1858, President Buchanan issued a proclamation offering a full pardon for all treasons and seditions to Mormons who submitted to federal laws and the Mormons agreed. The West owes much to men like Marcy, Powell, Long, Pike, the many mountain men like Jim Bridger, and to the conquistadores who shot and cut their way through Mexico and the Southwest. They flavored the land with their grand adventures and their occasional excesses, molding a regional personality which, to a small degree, still exists. The exciting days of the Pathfinders are gone, for which we can all give thanks. And as we drive over the superhighways that slice across the scenes of their hardships and accomplishments, it is difficult to imagine in this setting the difficulties of long ago. You can drive into any service station and, simply for the asking, receive a detailed map for which any of the early explorers would have gladly given his soul. Yet, has the spirit entirely vanished? Most of us don't venture into the wildernesses that still exist in the West for fear of getting lost. But how would the old timers face up to their kindred souls if they could come back today? What do you suppose would happen, for instance, if old Ponce de Leon went back to Florida looking for miracles and found a bunch of people getting ready to go to the moon? This is NET, National Educational Television.